Okay, so I'll start over again. Good morning, everybody. My name is Natalie Luna Rose. I'm the Communications and Outreach Manager for the Arizona Center for Disability Law. I just wanted to give a quick overview of uh, the process today. Um, thank you for joining us for our press conference um, on the report on um, crisis in Arizona and our um, people with disabilities. And before we get to talking about the report and uh, our speakers, I just wanted to do a quick um, etiquette uh, review on Zoom. If this is most likely not your first time, but just in case it is, bear with me. Uh, asking today, if you don't need your camera on, please uh, shut it off. We're asking just for the speakers for the press conference to have their camera on. Uh, make sure that your audio is, is um, off as well. Uh, reason to have the cameras uh, off is so we've got people who um, will need use of our ASL interpreters, uh, Jennifer and um, Audrey, and they need to be able to see them. So uh, please do that. If you have a question, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. You'll see it under the reactions button. Um, we will have time at the end for a Q&A. So um, if you want to hold your questions then, there's also always the chat box. If you feel like something is, has been said and you really need to um, get your question out or a statement, please use the chat box. Mm -hmm. That would be much appreciated. But again, if you can turn your camera off, if you are not a speaker or if you need your camera on to see the ASL interpreter, that is fine. But um, and please make sure that your um, your audio is off or your your microphone is off. Excuse me, your microphone is off. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it to um, Melissa Van Hook, who is um, the president of board of the Arizona Disabilities Planning Council, Developmental Disabilities Planning Council. Hey, good morning. Thank you, Natalie. Yes, as Natalie said, I am Melissa Van Hook. I'm the chair for the Arizona Developmental Disabilities Planning Council. I am also the parent of two sons with autism. Um, the Planning Council, if you're not familiar, we're one of um, every state in the country has a planning, has a DD Planning Council as well as the territories. And we, we work within our community on all levels uh, for those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And we cross over into other disabilities as well from time to time on issues such as behavioral health, um, access, Medicaid, Medicare, those who use DDD, we run the gamut with all that. So we have an opportunity to interact with everybody in our community, from the state agencies to providers to stakeholders, and most importantly, those stakeholders and our families. Um, we have worked closely for years listening to feedback from our community and for what they need. And when somebody gets in trouble or they get stuck and something fails them, they often turn to the council and ask for help. As we have moved forward over the years uh, and our networks have grown bigger, we've seen our community come together a lot on the stakeholder level with, with families in particular. We've heard more and more about families in crisis with behavioral health situations. And it's timely, it's been an issue for years um, and with the pandemic and with what we're going through now, it's even more on the forefront nationally than it has been ever. And that's a, a curse and a blessing as well. But so we began to hear more and more from people in our community in particular, longstanding issues. It just made it easier to talk about it. It made it more public. So we worked very closely in conversations. Um, Cynthia McCleskey, the president of Autism Society of Greater Phoenix, has worked in this arena and taken phone calls from families in crisis um, for the better part of two decades. And the last seven years has sat at the table again and again and again with the health plans, with DDD, with access to try and get some resolution. So Cynthia approached the council and we worked with a number of other people in the community um, on our report on Arizona's crisis response and people who have intellectual and developmental disabilities. And in that report, the feedback, really we came to consensus with, with what the big problems were. And those that contributed greatly to that report were Cynthia McCleskey and Autism Society, the council, Arizona Center for Disability Law. Um, we had input from first place on that. Kelly Carballo uh, with Jess Kelly, who's in MSW. Um, 
The point with all that is that all of our people in here are really connected to the community and we're in crisis, our people are in trouble and we really need for the system to start listening to people. Um, I'm not gonna get into much more than that other than that's how we came um, to be today. We really need to address the, situ the situation and the issues of really what's going on and why we're getting so many phone calls and why people are in trouble. So I'm gonna hand it over first to Asim Dietrich. He's an attorney for the Arizona Center for Disability Law, and he is actually going to speak first today. So thank you, Asim, if you're ready. Thank you, Melissa. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Asim Dietrich. I'm a supervisory attorney at the Arizona Center for Disability Law. Um, and we're a nonprofit law firm that assists Arizonans with disabilities to promote their legal rights to independence, justice, and equality. Um, and we're also the protection and advocacy system for Arizona. Um, so today I'd just like to speak about the, um, the disparities we've seen in the response to individuals with maybe experiencing a physical medical crisis and the response we've seen um, to individuals who, with IDD, uh, intellectual developmental disabilities, who may experience uh, a mental health crisis. Um, and I think at its core, um, this is an issue of unequal services uh, for persons with IDD who may have a mental health crisis um, when compared to either individuals without disabilities or individuals with physical disabilities. Um, so if you just think about the example of someone in a physical or medical uh, emergency, say they've had a heart attack or they've been in a car accident, that individual um, can call 911 and have an ambulance respond within three to five minutes and be transported to a hospital for care. Now, if we compare that to someone with intellectual development disability who experiences a mental health crisis. First, they need to have access to the crisis. My phone number, know what the phone number is because it's not a simple three-digit number um, like 911. So once they actually are able to call the crisis line, the crisis line staff are not always equipped uh, to provide verbal assistance um, over the phone to assist the person in dealing with that crisis. And mobile crisis teams are supposed to be available um, throughout Arizona. Um, but even when, even when a mobile crisis team is dispatched to the individual's location to assist them with their mental health crisis, uh, the wait for that uh, mobile crisis team can, can often be over an hour. Um, so this lack, um, these long wait times and the lack of adequate training to respond to mental health crisis of persons with IDD uh, place those individuals at risk of being injured or harming themselves or others um, and suffering uh, often devastating uh, consequences. Um, so if you just look at the two systems of the, the physical crisis system and then the mental health crisis system, there really is an, an inequality there uh, for persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities um, who also have mental health needs. And so, um, so that's really, um, you know, an issue of disparate treatment. Um, and then another point I would like to make is related to uh, funding for crisis services in, in Arizona. Um, so the American Rescue Plan Act that was passed um, early in 2021 uh, made additional Medicaid funding available to access for home and community-based services, as well as mobile crisis services. Um, so while access um, did receive federal approval for a, a plan that will invest an additional $1.5 billion in home and community-based services, this plan did not include any additional investments in crisis services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, additionally, ACCESS um, has yet to submit 
that separate application for additional funding for mobile crisis services that are available under the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, so that funding for mobile- Asim, you have about one minute left, okay? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to mention that the additional funding for mobile crisis services, the federal government would match that funding at 85% of the cost for the first three years. Uh, but access still hasn't applied for that additional funding for, for crisis services. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Asim. Next, we're going to hear from Cynthia McCluskey, the president of the Autism Society of Greater Phoenix. Hi, thank you. Um, Autism Society of Greater Phoenix has been in Arizona for almost 50 years, and we are run by families for families. Um, and I'm going to speak about the medical issues. So I'm going to give you two basic stories, the story of uh, a teenage girl who was headbanging um, to the point that they put a helmet on her and gave her behavioral health services for several years when it was finally discussed, discovered that she had an obsessed tooth, they removed the tooth and the headbanging went away. There was also uh, another story of uh, a boy that did this all the time and he wore a neck brace and he did that for several years when it was discovered that he had colitis and when that was treated, he no longer did that. What we're finding now is we're getting a lot of phone calls from families, especially with those with nonverbal teens. So I'm going to tell you three stories. Uh, a Hispanic male, 16, his augmentative device, uh, which was his only means of communication, was damaged. They asked for the developmental disabilities to fix it. They were denied that request. He became more and more violent. Crisis was called several times and law enforcement responded. They wanted to connect family to service. They reached out to me several times and other entities. Um, the law enforcement was very deeply concerned that the escalation of violence was going to put the child or the mother's life at risk. Seven months, several law enforcement contacts, family still in crisis, still doesn't have service. Young adult starts developing out of control behavior, experienced family requests additional services from behavioral health and DDD. Difficulty finding those services for a nonverbal adult with behaviors. Family calls crisis several times. The adult is transferred to a local emergency room where he's warehoused for many days while they're looking for inpatient treatment. The adult is finally transferred to uh, a low quality inpatient treatment center where he does not receive a medical workup as requested by the family. Once the family was uh, able to get their child out, they did get medical care and all those behaviors were eliminated. A young adult developed sudden onset violent behavior. Crisis is called and law enforcement transports to ER where he's warehoused for several days. Because of the intervention by a medical director, Leslie Paulus at United Healthcare, the child was screened for several comorbid conditions. It was discovered that an onset seizure disorder was causing the violence and once treated, the seizures, all behavior was eliminated. Autism is a complex neurodevelopment disorder with a high prevalence of serious medical conditions, including seizure disorder, metabolic, mitochondrial disease, gastrointestinal disorders, anxiety, ADHD, sleep disorders, just to name a few. And the presentation of those medical conditions can look vastly different in people with developmental disabilities. Autism Society has argued that before behavior is categorized as behavior, it should be looked at as a medical issue and screened for comorbid medical conditions. Often we find new behaviors are actually linked to medical issues or pain by, caused by the medical issue. There is only one medical autism clinic in Maricopa County. It's at Phoenix Children's Hospital and run by Dr. Fry. There is currently a wait list of one to two years to be seen for the first time at that clinic. Current patients are lucky if they're seen four to six months. Um, 
We have asked for a, uh, an additional clinic and expansion of that clinic. We've asked health plans to require screening for comorbid medical conditions associated with autism. Right now, there's no mechanism to make sure that pediatricians understand the comorbid medical conditions of autism and that they are screening for them. In the past, developmental pediatricians would do this screening. There are very few developmental pediatricians in our state. They mostly see young children and they mostly spend most of their time diagnosing autism instead of screening and treating conditions. Cynthia, you have one minute, okay? Thank you. Mm -hmm. It is difficult for families to navigate the healthcare system and find experienced qualified specialists who feel comfortable treating comorbid medical conditions with children and adults who have behaviors. We need more specialists who understand the comorbid conditions of autism. We need better trained pediatricians who screen yearly and whenever a new behavior starts. We need a behavioral health system that understands comorbid medical issues and works with the physical health to screen for these medical issues. We need full integrated behavior on physical health working together to provide good care for those with developmental disabilities in all settings. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from Diana Davis Wilson, the Chief Executive Advisor at Aspen Behavioral. Thank you, Melissa. Um, as Melissa said, my name is Diana, and I am a um, trainer with the law enforcement agency. So I do a lot of consulting um, in the areas of autism. I am a behavior analyst. I'm also the mother of a child with autism and bipolar disorder. My husband is a family violence detective. So he also has um, experience in uh, seeing firsthand what the families are experiencing when their uh, loved ones are in crisis. One of the areas that continues to be of uh, note and topic is law enforcement training. And while we are out and providing the training, there are a lot of great programs, especially in the urban areas, the rural areas are still vastly underserved. And while many trainers are able to get out to them, they're understaffed, they're underfunded. Um, there are a lot of missed opportunities uh, in, in working to the specificity that's needed for training in the rural communities versus what we are able to do in the urban areas. And we find that programs such as uh, VR training and other remote uh, mechanisms are underutilized across the state. We also note that uh, during times of crisis, there seems to be quite a bit of confusion between who is responsible for communicating um, across all aspects of, of, a, of a call. So we hear often uh, from officers that they are called to uh, calls with a report that crisis is unable to intervene because the behaviors are unsafe. Um, they are unable to intervene because they do not have staffing available or because they are unable to transport. Those officers are then um, expected to navigate the call um, from both a, a criminal perspective, which is what their primary role is, but also looking at the community safety. Um, one of the difficulties that we find is that in many of the legislation, the verbiage around uh, what's mandatory, what's a shall versus a must versus what is um, up to the discretion of an officer uh, varies across departments, it varies across programs, and it also varies across the interpretation of the officer. Unfortunately, many of these officers are in a position where acting on nothing is uh, less of a risk or a liability than to actually intervene. And many of them don't have the skill sets necessarily necessary to intervene safely. When um, an individual is uh, arrested or detained, brought down to um, the jail, there's very little contact between um, the, the officer and the jail system. The jail systems aren't always screening for um, the developmental disabilities. And so what we are finding is that um, in instances, and I'll give an example, uh, in Arizona, um, let's say a 17-year-old residing at home with their families that, that with their family that engages in um, destructive behavior that causes harm to a loved one um, could result in a mandatory arrest, as outlined in uh, legislation. And the officer detains the individual and transports them to the jail system. If the officer is not very clear on that um, intake form that the individual does have a developmental disability, there is no, or if the officer is not aware or doesn't have the ability to relay that, um, there isn't a way for the jail system to then screen for accommodations. And so what we've seen happen is individuals be arrested 
and uh, taken down to the to uh, the the uh, processing center at which they are expected at that time to advocate for themselves, meaning they are expected to know their rights, to know Miranda law, to know what their um, what their right to an attorney would include, how to ask for an attorney. Um, and those are skill sets that many of the individuals that we work with are unable to um, exhibit on their own. Um, oftentimes, because this is happening in their home residence, the family members become victims, which then creates a further divide as to how they can then advocate for the individual. And there isn't a lot of resources um, that are clearly identified um, for the families and or the officers to navigate what happens when the victim is the primary guardian or parent. But because of that, um, and it wasn't ad adequately relayed that now we are in a situation where perhaps we have a, um, a court order for no contact with the victim, even though the victim may actually be the, the primary um, guardian or, or individual to support that, that person. And then when they are released with the release- I know you have one minute. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And when they are released with release conditions of no contact with the victim, um, where do they go? And so there's um, a lot of confusion and disconnection about who, who they call, who they reach out to. Um, the training is often limited to how to improve interactions and not necessarily how do they interpret that interaction to then deciding um, between uh, what is probable cause, what is an exigent circumstance, and having to navigate all of the different decisions that they would then need to make in that situation, uh, which requires an entire level of um, specificity and training that isn't uh, clearly being provided above and beyond just how to best interact with the IDD community. Thank you, Diana. Uh, next, we're going to hear from David Jefferson, the founder and president of and civil rights advocate at Parent Support Arizona. Hello, everybody. Um, I started Parent Support Arizona because in my journey as a foster and then adoptive parent, I found it incredibly complicated to figure out what resources were available. And so we spend time helping families to identify how do they navigate the different state systems. Today, I, I want to start off by asking everybody to imagine that your loved one is in distress, not merely annoyed or upset or throwing a tantrum, but they are so emotionally dysregulated that they're banging their head on a concrete floor. You're panicked. You don't know what to do. You search for help and you find a phone number for the crisis line. So you call the number and they let you know that help is on the way. But then they share that that help might take 90 minutes or more to arrive. So without any other options, you do your best to console your loved one and you wait. After 15 or 20 minutes, things calm down a bit, the self-injury stops, and then without any real indication why, everything escalates again. So you decide, let me call the crisis line again, I'm gonna to explain to them what's happening, and I'm gonna see how long before they can get here. And they take down the information, but then they let you know they can't really commit to an arrival time and you just need to be patient. So a few minutes later, you hear a knock at the door and you're relieved, help is there. But when you open the door, you see that it's two uniformed police officers. They explain that they're there because Christ has contacted the department and asked them for help. You're appreciative of the help, but you're really unsure how they can help because your loved one has an intellectual or developmental disability and limited verbal communication skills. If you're disturbed when you hear this scenario, I want you to think about the fact that Many parents and family members, they have experienced this. This isn't a hypothetical. And for some of those families, they've experienced it multiple times. The focus of the report we're reviewing today is the current status of crisis services in our state. And during my time, I wanna talk about training, education, and communication, which I view as the three biggest system gaps that if corrected will lead to better outcomes for individuals with an intellectual or developmental disability who are in crisis. Based on my experience supporting thousands of families in our state, I can say for a certainty that our DDD support coordinators need additional training on identifying and supporting the behavioral health needs of our community of intellectual or developmental disability uh, individuals. These coordinators are dedicated to the families they serve, but without additional training, many are not equipped to make informed and specific recommendations to individuals on families on how they can seek the support that they need either before they're in crisis or while they're in crisis. The DDD contracted health plans 
include care coordination for DDE members who need behavioral health services. But for many of the members, they have limited contact with the health plan. Their primary point of contact is their DDD support coordinator, who they meet with regularly to develop and review their individual service plans. These support coordinators need more training on behavioral health and the needs of the intellectual development of the disability community so they can support members by identifying resources and coordinating behavioral health services. I also wanna call out that I think our DDD contracted providers and vendors need additional guidance and training on how they can support the behavioral health needs of these members. These providers work closely with individuals and families on a daily basis. They have a unique vantage point into the difficulties that families experience. And if they're provided with training tools and resources they can share with families, it may help families identify supports before they're in crisis. In addition, a lot of these providers and vendors need additional support to understand how they can successfully accommodate individuals with an intellectual or developmental disability, including how to use augmentative or alternative communication devices to engage with members. Presently, some members are experiencing barriers to receiving timely and appropriate services because the providers are not equipped to support their communication or behavioral health needs. David, you Finally, have one minute. Finally, families and individuals with an intellectual development disability need education on navigating the crisis behavioral health system. There are a lot of resources available, but identifying these resources, phone numbers and web pages can require an exhaustive search. Based on the findings in this report, the system has several resources that are designed to support families and individuals. Two examples I wanna call out, there's a justice liaison for interaction with law enforcement, jails, or judicial system, and there's behavioral health advocates that DDD makes available. I've supported individuals with an intellectual or developmental disability for almost 20 years now, and the first time I heard about either of those roles was when I read this report. The greatest tools in the world only work if people know where the tools are located and how to use them. Communication around these resources should be streamlined and simplified to eliminate confusion. There should be flyers created to help navigate the system before, during, and after crisis. These flyers should be broadly distributed and their existence should be reinforced during every touch point with DDD or crisis. The report that we're reviewing identifies that the primary theme resonating through each of the recommendations is a lack of education, training, and coordination. It is my hope that the community represented by the people who are here today can pull together and advocate for changes needed to address these easily corrected system shortcomings. Thank you. Thank you, David. Well spoken, sir. Um, finally, we're gonna hear from Colleen McGregor, the Administrator for the Office of Individual and Family Affairs. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Melissa. Um, and I'm honored and, and humbled to be here today. I want to um, first share that um, my most primary important role is a mom to a now 17 and a half uh, year old young man who's been um, receiving services in the public system since uh, goodness, 2005, I believe. And, um, and regrettably, and I think sadly, um, has not uh, been appropriately connected to, um, I say, developmentally appropriate services in a timely in a timely manner. And we're just blessed as a family that we've not touched the crisis system. The reason that we've not touched the crisis system, however, is because we did an overhaul of our life, and my my young son lives in a bubble. Um, I come to you really today though in support. Um, this is my community and I've felt a great deal of support over the years um, and feel um, compelled to share, I think, um, a resource that sits in front of us um, that could assist us and really a call to action in support of many of the policy recommendations. And that's where I, I professionally sit. So I oversee the Office of Individual and Family Affairs in one of the uh, managed care organizations. A uh, little disclaimer, I'm not here to speak on my managed care organization from that lens. I'm here um, really to I just felt compelled to share what the Office of Individual and Family Affairs does. 
Um, we are a contract required program that sits in all seven of the managed care um, organizations, including the Division of Developmental Disabilities. As David spoke to, um, our essence really is um, to ensure that voice is heard and choice is extended. We have um, contract language that speaks to ensuring that um, families that we serve by our contracted health plans um, are able to navigate the system, that um, their voice is being heard across not only the health plan, um, but all the way up to the Medicaid agency, and that their, their voice is uh, infused into strategic planning and decision making. I feel compelled to share this because I think some of the um, uh, um, policy recommendations, all which are valid, um, really we could take some immediate action around. For instance, um, requiring uh, stronger accountability of crisis service providers. Right now, now with the Office of Individual and Family Affairs, being contractually charged with um, really harnessing voice and elevating that across plan leadership, we are well poised to um, maybe place a call to action, uh, establishing formal um, member and family feedback mechanisms. We are well positioned um, to convene as a community to um, really look at um, establishing mechanisms for Bi-directional feedback. The Office of Individual and Family Affairs um, is housed at the Access or the Medicaid Agency. And um, we have a number of mechanisms, um, as many of you on this phone may be aware of, um, committees, councils, um, community conversations, mechanisms already in which are out in our community where we're asked to solicit feedback. But where does that feedback go? And how do we know as a community that action is being taken by not only the Medicaid agency, but our, our you know, legislative, our, our state leadership? Um, I feel that we could probably, I mean, this is an opportunity. We could enhance um, the expectation around what does um, ensuring voices heard really mean? Um, how could we, as a very active and engaged community, um, place a call to action around establishing formal mechanisms for that feedback? If you're going to capture um, my experience, um, I, I absolutely want to know what's being done of that. And there needs to be that transparency um, in ensuring not only are we being heard, that choice is being extended, but developmentally appropriate services and interventions are being offered. I know from my own experience that- um, Colleen, my, you have one more minute. Thank you, Stephen. Uh -huh. My son is complex. He has mild intellectual developmental um, differences. He has some global delay. There is not one service um, provider that has been able to meet him where he's at with developmentally appropriate services. My only action to take from my role is to file a grievance. But what happens even with that grievance? We really, um, I feel that there is a mechanism um, within each of our health plans that um, go up to our Medicaid leaders and to our you know, um, state leadership that we could leverage. This is an opportunity to perhaps place an expectation on more um, rigid accountability um, metrics. For instance, um, the other piece that I really wanted to speak to is scorecards. Why um, is there not transparency in our provider network performance? I feel, again, another call to action, perhaps leaning into the Office of Individual and Family Affairs to um, set that expectation. We as consumers of these services are entitled to know how um, uh, our provider partners are, are performing and to make an informed choice. And so I'm happy to share with the group, um, this information lives on Access OIFA's website 
Um, each of the plans have an OIFA lead such as myself, and we should not be above reproach with fielding, um, you know, concerns from our from our those that we serve. And I feel it's a great opportunity um, to place um, some time and effort in leveraging what's already existing for these changes. Thank you, Colleen. You make some very good points. In fact, there were some things that I was going to bring up myself. Um, you know, the need for, for scorecards and the biggest need we keep seeing again and again is the need for communication between all these agencies and the need for transparency. And I think if we had something like scorecards for the health plans, for the agencies, everybody needs to know what's going on and we need to know how they're performing and how they're doing. Um, we need transparency within the system. You know, for example, the internal policies that are often created by these agencies and oftentimes in response to a roundtable that goes on with a very small part of the community by those of us that are very vocal. All of a sudden there's like, oh, we have a policy for that. It's, a, it's an internal policy. Well, that's just great, but um, it's not effective. Uh, we, we need those policies to be publicly visible so members and advocates can see how things are supposed to be done. And by understanding how the systems of care are supposed to work and when things go off course for an individual, the public can hold the family more, the, the, the system more accountable, right? So we often don't know what's going on. We have family members that say, you know, I call this number on the back of my card and then I, I don't know what happens. I, I don't get the care that I need. It's, I'm supposed to get a call back from somebody. I don't get a phone call. Um, I have a child that I had to take to the emergency room at Phoenix Children's and he's been sitting in restraints in the ER for three days because they can't reach my health plan and my care provider for behavioral health. This is a broken system. It's not little kids, it's big kids. We truly, truly need for the systems to work in a transparent way and much more cohesively and they need to be held accountable. Um, this is a really marginalized population disability to talk about being marginalized and invisible. Um, and because economically, oftentimes individuals need help. They don't have the full-time jobs that pay for private health care benefits. They are stuck in the system and it's a system that's failing them and sees them as an economy, um, excuse me, a commodity. I think that if our health healthcare providers, our system providers, and more importantly, our legislators um, need to see the faces and hear the stories from these families directly. You need to hear from people that this system has failed them, whose loved ones were so failed that they gave up, they took their own lives. And I think what we need really is, sorry, I have a fly, I have an issue here. I think what we really, really need uh, are some open conversations publicly. We would welcome a discussion with our legislators because we do need some oversight on fixing the issues. Um, State Medicaid leadership needs to join us in fixing the issues as well, and perhaps OIFA can play a part in that. And to wrap up, it, it, the report is long, but if you take the time to read it, it explains the issues pretty clearly. Um, but in summary, you know, we are we're requesting what we're, we're actually demanding, it's not even a request, is it require stronger accountability of the crisis service providers to start. Monitor all those communication protocols. If they're supposed to be an email or a phone call or a check-in to keep track of the member and where they're at in the system in their crisis, ensure that it happens and follow up with it. Hold your own people accountable for doing their jobs. We need training, resources, and potential legislative changes for law enforcement. They're trying to meet us, but we've got to meet them halfway as well. Uh, we need um, DDD support coordinators and health plans um, to be required for additional training on their behavioral health needs of the intellectual and developmental disabilities community. We need DDD contracted providers and vendors to require additional guidance on the behavioral health needs of those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Families and people with in intellectual and developmental disabilities need education on navigating the crisis behavioral health system. And finally, we need to improve training on intellectual and developmental disabilities for medical students, family practice residents, and general physicians. Thank you. I'm gonna hand it off to you, Natalie, to address any questions. All right. Well, thank you, Melissa, and thank you to all our speakers today. Um, we do have some time. Um, we uh, got about 15 minutes for question and answer. So I am going to open up um, if any members of the media have any questions. 
Um, and if you have questions, I know there was one or two questions in the chat and I'm going back through them right now. And um, again, if you have, you know, use your raise hand function or you're, you're welcome to also just open it if you feel brave enough, but please, if members of the media are, have questions or follow up. Um, there is a question, I do believe it was during a SEAMS presentation um, from Branded Vaz. What if an individual with IDD or Spectrum gets terminated from employment amid a crisis, or rather during his, her mental health crisis? Well, um, depending on the, the type of crisis, it could possibly be an issue of employment discrimination if someone lost their job uh, based upon their their disability. Um, there are exceptions in certain situations where if there's a direct threat to um, other employees, but um, it definitely could be an issue. And uh, my advice would be that they contact the Arizona Center for Disability Law and do an intake um, and see if they can receive any additional um, self-advocacy information. Thank you, Sam. And I'm putting um, the Arizona Center for Disability website in the chat, azdisabilitylaw.org, where you can always email us at, AZ Disabil at center at azdisabilitylaw.org as well. Um, and next question, uh, Stephanie Innes. Hi, yeah, thanks for doing this report. I wondered who you'd sent the report to and who you are seeking to take action? Is it the legislator, legislature? Is it the um, access? Is it ADHS or all of the above? Is there anyone in particular that you'd like to pay attention to this report? Cynthia, do you want to take that? Sure, I would love to. Thank you. Um, First of all, we would we want to come to the table with the health plans and DDD, um, and we want uh, legislators to participate in that process because we want this process to not just be meetings, but to actually have goals that we meet at the end of the process. So we're looking to engage the entire system, but we're especially requesting that legislators participate in this process. They're con they control the funding and, and they can also really hold um, state agencies accountable in a way that the disability community cannot. Thank you. And I had one follow-up uh, question just about the um, crisis line that access operates. I think now it's done in three different, um, there's three different lines, if I'm correct, for the three different REBAs, but it's going to be one number um, moving forward. Is this an opportunity to um, maybe make some improvements on that if it's going to be only one vendor? Cynthia, go right ahead. I would love to answer that. Um, it could improve things or it could not. Currently, vendors are allowed to survey themselves on if they're doing a good job. We would like the health plans to be surveying members to give feedback about the providers and if they actually are doing a good job. So unless we have some mechanism to track that the provider is, is actually delivering what they said they would contractually, we have, it doesn't guarantee that there's gonna be improvement just because there's one provider. So um, I think the jury's out on that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have um, any other questions? Don't be shy, go ahead and um, have your opportunity to, to ask. Natalie, there is one in the chat oh, yeah. Nancy yeah, Lucas. It says, do other states have a model that works well? What benchmarks processes that, the, that they use for tracking and evaluating? And, and, and I can speak to this, but Cynthia too, um, unfortunately, sadly, there really is no state that's doing a good job with this. Um, 
Amy Silverman locally is a reporter that has done a lot of investigative journaling here at journalism, excuse me. And as well as there have been reports recently, Cynthia, I don't know if, if it was the Wall, Wall Street Journal or which publications that have done a deep dive into uh, the behavioral health system, particularly as it relates to those with disabilities who are failing abysmally. Did you have a comment on that, Cynthia? I think it was the, um... The Washington Post did a, oh. did a, a, a complete expose. And I can tell you that my, um, my cousin is in Nevada. She's a fire chief and she serves on their state committee trying to improve crisis. And my other cousin is in um, Colorado serving in that same way. I think every state sees that there's these issues, but there isn't a state that I know of that is that's leading the way in innovation um so it's up to us in our state to fix our state system we are structured differently each state structures what they provide differently we have a very unique waiver for our medicaid so definitely we need to do a deep dive in what best practices look like but i don't know of anybody that's actually doing it successfully yet So there, so there is no best practice. There doesn't appear to be, which is pretty sad because you're talking about a population that has trouble advocating for itself and relies on families to do that for them. Um, and I, actually, the Washington Post really talked about the warehousing of people with autism in ERs for days and weeks and how they never did get real medical evaluations because that's not done in an ER setting. So we waste so much resource when we put, we take people to the ER, but then we don't do any of the workup that might actually benefit them. So it's, it, and that's an ongoing problem nationwide. Okay. Um. There's another question or another well, a statement from Susie Turry. The other thing that needs to be understood when a medical issue is not addressed, the individual may be given drugs or labeled or diagnosed incorrectly. My son drug intake made his behaviors worse. And then a follow up from Nancy Lucas, each state can determine their own scope of medical coverage. So Arizona can set their own standards for any medical provider group or insurance to offer their products in our state. And thank you for your comments. Um, yes, thank you. Cynthia El Elliott had her hands up as well. Cynthia. I couldn't find it on the chat. Okay. So I did my real hand. I just want to throw something out there that hasn't been touched on except by our interpreters is that my daughter has all of the above and she's profoundly deaf. So crisis has not ever been useful if they can even get out there, like the same issues everybody else has. And actually, Mesa, PD, and Fire have been, uh, we, I don't even try crisis. Um, Mesa has a pretty good program. And even with her deafness, the PD and Fire have been our go-to. And we're talking about several times a month. Um, so I have to put in a good word for them this crisis has not ever been successful. I think that's a really important point too. I heard from several families that crisis is also not good if you're a member is in a wheelchair. And um, that's something I hadn't really thought about, but we've gotten some feedback over the last few days that that too is an issue. Kathy Ritchie has a question. Kathy Ritchie here with KJAZ News. Are there any lawmakers who plan to propose legislation to address the concerns in this report? I, uh, we were talking to Senator Barto, and we're hopeful that she might do something. Um, Representative London, I think, may have some interest um, and has been passionate about this issue. Um, we're, we're really seeking families to contact their local legislative leaders so we can engage the process. 
Um, and uh, so we hope to see something. One thing that we think would be an easy ask is to run legislation that would track CIT training in every department in the state so we could monitor that level. The national goal is 25%. Um, and some of our areas are doing are very successful and some of our areas are not. And if we were tracking that, we could incentivize the areas that are struggling to be able to do a better job that way. Okay, thank you. Uh, question from Brandon Vaz. Is there a centralized hub or universal portal or database that simplify, simplifies the view of medical behavioral properties? like a flagging system that basically prompts the professional to read further on what is being flagged, seems like it's consistently overlooked or ignored. The only thing I know is Phoenix Children's Hospital is looking at something to do in their ER, but in general, I don't, I don't know of anything that's been set up that way yet. I'm not aware either. Um, I can tell you in the autism community, we're certainly trying to educate our medical professionals in a big way. Um, Dr. Jim Adams can speak to that. Dr. Fry can speak to that. But it is something we're trying to educate within our own community because the professionals themselves don't know. So I'm not aware of any hub either. There certainly should be, um, without a doubt. Thank you. Um, Follow-up from Kathy Ritchie. Some of the con Concerns issues brought up have been brought up in other reports pertaining to the IDD community before and after Hacienda. How do you move the needle on this? I think this is our first step. I mean, having the conversation, uniting disability groups, um, activating our own committee, our community, trying to get people to report on the issue, raise awareness around it. Um, I think this is our first step. Well, and I would tell you that in response to Hacienda, because the council and Erica McFadden in particular, our former executive director really led the way on that. You know, what part of what made that response so effective was that we asked for and got a task force through the governor's office to look at the issues around sexual abuse of vulnerable adults. And out of that came a number of work groups, uh, the, the criminal justice task force, that a lot of training for law enforcement um, and court um, court attorneys and lawyers and, and stuff came out of. There's been stuff on sexual abuse in school that came out of. Um, that has been really effective. We've talked about requesting the same thing. Just going to bring up the elephant in the room. It's silly season. It is an election year. So the governor is in his last term of office. Um, it's often harder to get a task force in the last term of anybody's office, a uh, year in office. So we don't know that that's going to happen. But it would be a really good place to start. Task force tend to be a little bit, um, that they're not done in three months. And what comes out of it, you need some consistency. But that certainly elevated the issue of Hacienda to a higher level. Um, and that's exactly what we need to do here as well. I know Dee Friedman had a comment as well in there. Exactly, yeah. thank you. I was no. just about to read it. because Right, I'll can read you, it. Can you jump in? Thank you, yeah. Maddie. Will you be at from Dieter Friedman? Will you be asking for effective and integrated care coordination during and after crisis, especially the universal use of the Arizona electronic health record system mandated by access? Yes, Dee, that's exactly what we're asking for and have been asking for for many years. Um, and we hope that we can get um, complete integrated care for our members. Uh, we haven't yet. Okay. That's exactly part of the problem because it's there and it's not being utilized. There is this lack of coordination. There is this lack of communication in general. Somebody is in a massive crisis and they just get dropped in the system. System. I mean, David, you explained perfectly well kind of what happens in somebody waiting and it's the police that show up and they're doing their best, but they're really not part of that system. So there is no further involvement half the time by, by the crisis intervention system, right? Unless you as a family member contact the support coordinator and anybody else they don't end up being flagged, right? Universal health records. And actually, Melissa, Autism Society of Greater Phoenix just started a crisis class 
um, that we're making available for free to all families. And then we'll be videotaping it because there's so much misunderstanding of what's actually supposed to happen. We thought if we could actually train our own families of what's supposed to happen, they could actually put pressure on the system to do what's supposed to be done. So that's the one thing that we're doing to try to move the needle as well. Okay, thank you. Um, we have just a few more questions, a little bit of time for a few more questions. This is from Edmine. Um, Years ago, the blind community were a strong lobbying group. Then years later, the physically disabled community came across strong and helped pass the historical ADA. Is the IDP community coming together to push for reforms? How is Arizona connected to the national yeah. screen? Well, that's kind of the purpose. I mean, we've had all kinds of individuals come forward uh, to both the council, to Autism Society. I think, I think Natalie, you guys at Arizona Center for Disability Law have heard from um, individuals as well. So this is kind of the start of that. Um, we need people to be on the same page. It's our hope that by making it more public and holding a public conversation, we can reach out to all of those stakeholders to um, do come together to push for reform. And on the national screen, we're sharing our report with uh, national um, DD planning councils, but everybody is in crisis of their own right now. So we're all kind of left to fend for ourselves to be perfectly honest with you, Mr. Somebody else. Natalie, I know there's I know there's lots of comments in there in the chat yeah, box. We we do. Um, so uh, to answer, okay. So Karen Wilson, my question is, what happens after the crisis? What is the follow up? It's more like what is it supposed to be, right? So Cynthia or David or Colleen, any of you guys want to take that one? I want to because it's my pet peeve. So what's supposed to happen is crisis owns the member in crisis for 23 and a half hours. After that 23 and a half hours, crisis is supposed to hand off to um, the health plan or DDD or both. And so the crisis health plan is supposed to be sending reports to both DDD and the health plan that they are currently um, with so that they can provide additional services. However, when you talk to the other health plans and DDD, um, there's conflicting information on what they receive and when they receive it and what action is taken once they receive it. And this is an area that we think really needs transparency and accountability. So if we have a certain number of people that call crisis, that we know our DDD people, who's following to see how long it takes for everybody to be contacted and for additional services to be added? Right now, I can't find any of that data being tracked because when I ask for it, it can't be delivered. So I don't think they're tracking it. And that's really important because once you're in crisis, there's a bunch of things that are supposed to happen. And if those aren't happening, that's why we get people who call us and say, that's why I have law enforcement call me on a Sunday morning and say, we've responded to this house seven times in five months and they're still not getting any service that they need. Can you help us? Like that should not be happening. Thank you, Cynthia. So as we're, I'm getting, uh, as we're wrapping up here, I do want to make a comment. Um, uh, one more from Gabriela Rosco. And the Spanish speaking community has such a difficult time even opening up about this. Awareness of all of this is key, maybe eventually clashes in Spanish. And I know there was a follow up with that from Edmenia. Besides all the issues the IDP community is having, is there an equity disparity among Latinos, Blacks, and Natives? And I think that could be probably our last question for the day. Yeah. Well, and, and Natalie, uh, well, okay, from the council perspective, I can say yes, Latinos, Blacks, and Natives, those are all underserved communities. So, absolutely. I mean, that sadly kind of goes without saying. It's why we need more people at the table. We need to hear from community members specifically and what they need. Um, yes, it's something that we are, we are trying to reach out to more people. So if you know somebody who wants to speak up, who wants to be part of this, who wants to share their story, bring them to the table. We're here. We want to know. And Natalie, um, for Arizona Center for Disability Law, I don't know if that's something that you have seen bigger issues with as well, that disparity. Uh, we have. Um, currently, we actually are part of a group, which DDPC is a part of the um, 
linguistic cultural linguistic competency um, group, and there's uh, five um, members of the group, including ACDL. So we are cognitively uh, cognitive about it and um, internally, and then working the system externally. And I, I would venture to say that Asim would probably agree with that as well. So um, we get a lot of reports from the. You just muted out, Cynthia. Oh, sorry, we get a lot of reports from the Hispanic com um, community around crisis and DDD. So a lot of times they'll ask for services that other families ask for and get, and they get denied. So I, I think that there is a very serious issue in what uh, the Hispanic community, how they're treated and what they have access to. Um, and there needs to be a lot more done around that area. Uh, and Gabby runs uh, the Spanish speaking support group in the West Valley, and she does a fantastic job of trying to raise awareness, but that's definitely a huge issue that needs to be um, resolved. Okay, and Natalie, we've got lots of comments that are going to go on, and I know that right. this is we could cover in, in time, you know, the, the post crisis response, all kinds of things. So I think really what next steps are is that we need to have some very public conversations, some forums, and invite those people to the table that need to be there. The people from state Medicaid, from DDD, from Access, um, the health the healthcare plans, and some of our legislators. We need to have this public conversation. So when we have those forums and we'll push them out through all the listeners, we'll push them out through contacts today. We'll put everything out there. When we have those conversations, we need for you to step up and be there. Um, and when, when we ask for you guys to send your stories to the legislators, to the health plans, to whatever, when there's a call to action, we need for you to respond to that and do what's being asked um, in the sense that please participate. We so appreciate you being here today. You're here because you care. You're here because you want it to be different. You're here because you're, you know there are issues. So the next step is that conversation. Um, and when we have those, we need you here. We need your voices at the table with those people that um, have some power to make some decisions and the ones we need to hold accountable. So and that's what I've got. All right. Well, again, thank you everybody for coming today. Um, I have put my email for follow up, whether it's media or otherwise, um, and Luna Rose at acdisabilitylaw.org. Um, and I will um, echo Liz's thank you for starting this conversation. And this is a conversation we um, hope to have, and can, uh, not just today, but every day until we see what, um, you know, what changes can, can be made and, and keep going with this. So again, thank you. And thank you to our ASL interpreters, uh, Lori and I'm sorry, Lori did our, our uh, closed captioning. Uh, Audrey and Jen, thank you so much. And Lori for our closed captioning. And um, you're well, uh, free to go, enjoy your lunch. And if the panel can stay on, um, much appreciated. And thank you and have a great day.